people on Zoom, people in the room, we will call to order the November meeting of the Douglas County Board of Health. For the record, there is a copy of the Open Meetings Act uh, back on the uh, west wall here in the legislative chambers, and there has been official notice of uh, publication uh, with that roll call. Okay, Wade? Yes, here. Festerson? Yes, here. <laughs> McNally is not. Rogers? Here. Weiss? Yes. Jones? Wilkin? No. King? No. Espinoza? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, item two is the approval of the minutes of the uh, October meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by uh, Wade. Is there a second? Second. Second by Weiss. Roll call. Okay, Wilkin? Wade? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Jones? No. Weiss? Yes. And Festerson? Yes. Item three is public comment. There is an opportunity for individuals on Zoom or in the audience to comment on items not officially uh, listed, public health items not officially on today's agenda. Are there any public comment from anybody? Seeing none, we'll go down to um, item four. And we have items uh, A through W for approval and ratification. Note that item E should be removed uh, because there's some more work needs to do there. And then from item R, for the record, the number on the agenda is incorrect. And Sunday, can you read the correct number in the record just so it's there for item R? And the correct number is 76009. Okay, 76009. With that, is there a motion to approve the uh, items A through W with the removal of E? E and U. And, and I thought it was, is it? Yeah, without, oh, sorry, I need to stay on that. Thank you. Uh, the motion is to approve A through W, scratching E and removing O to go separate. Second. Hold motion on. by Hold Weiss, on. is there a second? Sir, I'm sorry. The, the letter U, it says agreement with UNMC regarding a student affiliation. Uh -huh. Letter U, that that one needs to be struck. Okay, noted. Uh, with that change, there's motion, assuming Y still is motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Wade. Uh, roll call. Okay, Festerson? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Wilkin? Yes. Weiss? Wait. Yes. Um, item O is approval of a second amendment with Charles Drew regarding WIC. Is there a motion to approve letter O? So moved. Motion by Wise, second by Festerson. Uh, roll call. Okay, Festerson? Yes. Uh, Rogers? Abstain. Abstain. Wade? Yes. Weiss? Yes. Wilkin? Yes. Okay. Item H is um, health director's report and the issues of discussion. Dr. Hughes. Good, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning. Um, have a few things to cover today. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just do a quick uh, notification that we have hired a few new people on this month and we're very excited about that. Uh, first of all, we have our new workforce development coordinator, which I am so excited for. Um, this individual is going to really uh, be that person who is able to uh, work on our on trainings, uh, finding professional development, really supporting our workforce in the things that they need to be successful, and uh, of course helping leadership to be successful as well. We're very excited about this. Uh, we haven't had a robust orientation uh, program for new hires for a really long time, and so uh, that is something that this individual will be doing, and so we are very, very grateful for her. Um, we also have brought on our accreditation coordinator, so that person is now uh, actually working in the office, and we were able to submit our application for accreditation a, about a week early, is that right? So um, we are very, very grateful for that, and we are well on track to achieve our accreditation. So. Uh, third time's the charm. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. It's gonna work out great this time. 
Um, we're really excited about that. Um, I also wanted to let you know that I should probably have asked you if you are cool with this, but I'm so proud that I have to brag, um, even though it's not really me brag, my achievement. Um, but Jamin Johnson uh, was able to successfully defend his dissertation last Monday. And so we are very proud of him for uh, achieving such a huge thing in life. Um, earning your doctorate is something really special. So we're very proud. Congratulations, Damon. OK, um, I wanted to uh, take some time to update you on the rabies situation that you got to hear about the last time we gathered a month ago. So um, the community has kept us very, very busy over the past month and a half or so. Um, the first issue we had, as you know, was rabies. You had the CDC uh, here last month to talk to you. For the most part, that situation has wrapped up. So if you recall, uh, we had a kitten that was diagnosed with a kind of odd strain of rabies that you typically don't see here. And that really spurred a very large response to ensure that um, raccoon rabies is not actually established here in Douglas County. Um, that was really a three-pronged effort. So there was surveillance happening, test, which is uh, basically testing dead animals to see if rabies was present. That's actually gonna be ongoing until probably any time between December and February. Um, they have a certain number that they want to be able to test uh, between 400 and 600 specimens. So uh, right now I think they, they're sitting um, at around 200, so they've got a little ways to go yet. Um, and that's gonna be, uh, that, the testing for that is going to be transitioned over to the UNL Veterinary Diagnostic Center. Um, and I think that transition happened last Monday. And then we had the trap vaccinate release program, which is where we put traps out that were baited. Uh, we were able to trap uh, raccoons and a few other little critters and vaccinate them manually against rabies. Um, they were able to uh, vaccinate 753 raccoons, 41 skunks, four cats, <laughs> and a fox. Um, so that was a pretty successful effort. And then there was the oral rabies vaccine campaign. And this was the, the little, I call them raccoon ravioli because of the, the stuff they put on the outside. It looks like it's breaded like a little ravioli, but basically little vaccine packets that were put out all around town in a, about a 64 um, square foot or square mile radius, not square foot, that'd be really ineffective. Uh, and Basically, they put out about 18,000 of those little raccoon raviolis, and uh, that was an incredible effort uh, by a number of organizations that kind of came together to go out and get all of those little packets placed out in the community. So um, that was very successful as well. Um, so far, um, let me see if I can, yep, 206. So. So far, for all of, the, all of the animals that they have tested, we've had zero positive rabies. So that is excellent news. Uh, we hope it stays that way. So at this point, it's looking as if that kitten likely was imported here, maybe from somewhere on the East Coast, and that we don't actually have it established here uh, in Douglas County, which is what, what we want. So um, I think that was a very successful campaign. Um, there were a number of organizations and agencies that came together to pull off that huge, uh, that huge activity, and we're so grateful to all of them just for their expertise, uh, for their willingness to help out and, and be part of that effort in order to protect their community. Um, we, we could not have had a more smooth and well-run um, event, so very grateful to them for that. Does anyone have any questions about raccoon rabies? Lindsay, I had to say, um, um, as you were noting there, that uh, it was quite the mobilization by you and your staff and multiple agencies, and I commend you for doing that so quickly. Um, kind of a case in the, the importance of public health, right, that people don't always think about. Yeah. Um, so in your current status uh, assessment there, is it, 
I know testing is ongoing, but mm -hmm. it, is it safe to say it's not established or just that's the designation so far? I am cautiously optimistic that it is not established here in, in Douglas County. I don't, I don't want to uh, you know, say for sure that it is not here until they've had more samples tested. Uh, but at this point, it's looking pretty good. Um, you know, our, our big variants here are bat rabies and skunk rabies, and I think hopefully it's going to stay that way. So far, it's looking really good. Will there be a point in time where that's an official designation? Yeah, yeah. As soon as they're finished with that component of this response, so the testing component, the, sur the surveillance that's being done at UNL Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. So once they're, they feel that they have tested sufficient samples to say, okay, we've, the, this sample is, is pretty reliable, then, then we can say with pretty good certainty that it's not here. So December, between December and February, um, the weather impacts how, how many animals are out and about. And so um, that can either slow things down or speed things up depending on what they're able to get their hands on. Okay. Yeah. And then a funny story I told Lindsay before the meeting, my, uh, my beagle found one of the packets you were describing there and <laughs> chomped on it a little bit, but as advertised, it was harmless to pets and other animals, so he's fine, and uh, I appreciated the information you had on your website about that. He just got a little <laughs> booster. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Is that it? Okay. I think that's all I have for you today. Then let's just transition into uh, item six in the presentation on tuberculosis. So the CDC left our, <laughs> our conference room on the 3rd, and on the 6th, we had another great big public health emergency rear its head. So uh, not much of a break there. Um, and let me get this pulled up because I want to make sure everybody's on the same page with what's going on here. Okay. So, um, on the on the sixth of November, we received a positive lab for an individual uh, who was suffering from symptoms of tuberculosis, and those lab results, unfortunately, were positive. It's not completely unheard of in our community to have active cases of tuberculosis. We get about 15 to 20 a year um, that we typically will investigate. Um, if you think about how we used to do the contact tracing with COVID, that was not a new activity for us. We've been doing that with tuberculosis and other uh, communicable diseases for, for many, many years. So as soon as we got those positive labs, we initiated a contact interview. Uh, and unfortunately, we were uh, notified that this person had been, uh, had spent mul multiple days and times in the uh, Westview YMCA child watch area. So child watch is a little different than your typical daycare setting. Typically in a daycare setting, what you see is people uh, enroll their children to a classroom and it's the same kids that are there every single day. Drop-in care works a little bit differently. So this is a basically a child watch uh, that members of the Y are able to bring their children and drop them off uh, in the child watch area for a couple of hours at a time while they go use the facility however they choose. Um, so that means a lot more people in and out of that area. So all said and done, uh, we were able to identify uh, around 550 children and staff that were uh, exposed to this active case of tuberculosis. Um, typically, we don't get that many uh, exposures when we're doing one of these. So what makes this, this particular instance um, kind of unique is, is really the scope. We're uh, very, very many people um, that we are having to um, work with on this to ensure that they don't have tuberculosis. So I'm gonna give you just a really, really quick, quick overview of tuberculosis, just because it helps, I think, you to understand, uh, for you to understand 
uh, how how we go about responding to this. So tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria, uh, and it usually affects the lungs. However, it can attack any part of the body. So typically we see pulmonary, um, but there are times when you see it in other parts. And with children, especially young children, you can see this progress to um, kind of a like a disseminated disease or a disease that is uh, throughout the entire body or in other organ systems fairly quickly. So in this instance, it made it very important that we respond very quickly because we had a number of small children involved. Um, not everybody who is infected with tuberculosis actually gets sick. So tuberculosis exists in uh, a couple of different forms once it infects somebody. Uh, there's latent tuberculosis and in the latent form you're almost like a carrier you've got it in your system uh, but it's not making you sick and you're not contagious to other people where we worry is when it's an active tuberculosis infection so uh, once it's a tuberculosis disease then you're symptomatic and likely contagious um, to other people and tb is fatal or can be fatal if it's not treated especially in children so again um, that kind of gave us an extra layer of importance in responding to this. Um, it spreads through airborne droplets, and they're expelled when a person um, coughs, sneezes, shouts, sings, talks, things like that. Um, and then, of course, the other indiv another individual who's in the in the area could breathe in those droplets. Um, it is not quite as transmissible as something like COVID or the flu or a lot of those cold viruses that are out there. Um, it takes a little bit longer, more close contact to spread it um, to another person. So we typically say that if you're in, in a, um, if you're in an environment with someone who has active TB disease for you know, 30 minutes or more um, in an enclosed area. And if you're having face-to-face -face contact and things like that, uh, we would consider you an exposure. There are a couple of different ways that we figure out how someone or if someone has tuberculosis. So we're able to test in a couple of different ways. Um, one of those is the PPD skin test or TB skin test. And a lot of you, if you work in healthcare, you have probably had more than one of these done. Um, and basically this is some um, fluid that contains dead bacteria from TB um, that's injected underneath the skin. And you wait a couple of days to see if a lump forms under, uh, under the skin where that was placed. And if, it's, if a, a lump does form and it's more than five millimeters, we consider that a positive. Um, if there's no bump, you're not positive. So that's good. Dr. Um, Hughes, yeah. You, you you may need to minimize that box. This one right here, sorry about that. Yeah. Or minimize the whole gallery. I did on, let's see, better? There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, there are, uh, there is a vaccine for tuberculosis. It is not in use in the United States. It's in use in other countries. Uh, but we do get a number of people in the United States who have had that vaccine, and that can cause a false positive on these skin tests. Uh, the other way we test is through a blood test. It's an IGRA. Um, and basically, you collect four tubes of blood. Uh, those results are usually ready within 24 to 48 hours. The nice thing about this is that we can test people who've had that vaccine and get a more accurate result. Unfortunately, we can't use it in under two um, children, and so we have to place that skin test for all of those really, really young exposures. Now I'm gonna click on the wrong one to try to advance my slides. All right, so like I said, uh, we had a case that was identified. We had a number, uh, a large number of exposures that, that we needed to work with. So. Uh, like I said, we immediately started a case investigation to identify contacts. Um, once we knew uh, where the expo this exposure had occurred, we were in contact with um, our medical consultant, Dr. Neiman, uh, with the YMCA where this occurred. We brought in DHHS. Uh, we called the CDC and consulted them um, with our plan just to make sure we weren't missing anything. Uh, Nebraska Public Health Lab and Children's Nebraska. 
Uh, we work together to identify, notify, educate, coordinate, test, and treat over 550 people. Um, so that's an ongoing effort so far. Um, I can't give you an exact number because our clinic literally just started 20 minutes ago. So I don't know how many kids they've seen yet, probably about six. Um, but at Children's, Children's Nebraska held a clinic over the weekend where they were able to test 270 children. And those, most of those children uh, are, are more recent exposures and very young. So they're ones um, who would need something called window prophylaxis, which I'll cover here in just a minute. Uh, but if, if Children's had not uh, been willing to step up and help us with that, there's, we would, we would still be um, maybe, you know, 50 kids in to this effort just because of the, uh, the complexity of when you have these littles come in, um, they, you know, it's, it's not just placing a test and sending them home. They get an entire assessment, they get that test, they get chest x-rays, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, and so we are so incredibly grateful to Children's uh, for helping with that effort. Um, the, the kids that are a little bit older and maybe have l later or uh, older exposures uh, are coming to our clinic and they don't require quite the same level of testing. They, those children were able to just test, um, read those tests, and then they're, they're finished. So uh, our, our side of that response is not quite as complex as children's was. Uh, we did stand up our incident management team right away to manage our response internally. Um, our response has touched almost, I think, every section in our department. Uh, we've utilized people to man our call line. Uh, we've had people making phone calls out to patients. Um, very grateful just for how quickly the IMT was able to get things moving uh, so we could get these kids taken care of. Uh, we also work to identify resources, and this is an ongoing effort. So as you can imagine, this is an extremely expensive response, um, it, it, especially when you're talking about a lot of clinical care and medications, the costs add up very quickly. Uh, and so um, we, we have tried to minimize the cost where we could in terms of you know, asking for assistance from other health departments, um, things like that but we also know that there's gonna be quite an expense to this. Um, so we're working to identify funding. Um, DHHS has been wonderful um, in helping with this. So ensuring that kids that are not able to pay for, uh, or families that are unable to pay for um, testing and treatment and things like that have, there's, there's an avenue out there, but we're still working through uh, what all of that looks like. I did do an emergency declaration, so uh, a declaration of a public health emergency. This is administrative. This isn't asking anybody to do anything. This is really saying, hey, this is a problem that we have in our community. Um, it's, it's big, it's a big deal, the scope is large, um, and hopefully that will smooth the way for any resource requests going forward. Like I said, we expanded our information line. Uh, very grateful for the staff that were able to just jump in and who volunteered to give up their holiday on Friday to come in and answer those calls. So uh, we were able to get letters out only a couple of hours before we had a parent listening session. So we knew that there was going to be a number of people out there who had questions and needed answers um, who were not able to attend that listening session. So it was really important to us that we had that information line up and moving the next day so that people could still um, get their questions answered. And that went really well. And that moves us into uh, today. Today we are uh, initiating our own uh, pod testing clinic. So pod is just kind of the format that we use. So anytime uh, we have a public health emergency and there's the potential that you might need to administer medications or vaccines or in this case testing, uh, you can set up kind of this, this point of dispensing is what we call it. it and uh, it's, a, it's a great way to get people in and through in a very organized way. And I'll show you that here in just a minute. And I'm still clicking on the wrong one, that's funny. 
Um, if you've ever wondered what it looks like to respond to an emergency on the public health level, uh, this is this is just the first page of our objectives. Um, so when we stand up an IMT, one of the very first things we do is sit down and figure out, okay, what needs to happen? What ne what do we need to do? Who who needs to do it? When do we need to have it done by? So it's a very, very organized approach to response. Um, and so uh, our ERCs set this up. And like I said, this is only the first page. I didn't think you really wanted to see the whole thing, but I did want you to just visually get an idea of um, kind of the complexity and, and the fact that there's a lot of work that goes into uh, one of these clinics or one of these responses. So talking just a little bit about um, contact investigation and the testing that we're doing. Uh, so we have two cohorts. We have the cohort that went to Children's. We have the cohort that's coming to us this week. Um, so children who were exposed prior to August 21st, so that was going back to like May, um, they will get, depending on their age, either the skin test or the blood test, and they only need one test, and they don't have to take any kind of prophylaxis. And the reason for that is enough time has passed that their immune systems would have responded to any pathogen. Um, and so if they're not testing positive, there's no reason for them to be on medication. We can be pretty certain that they don't have tuberculosis. Um, however, the children who were exposed uh, before August 21st, um, or after August 21st, I'm sorry, will we'll actually need two tests. So what we've seen uh, through children's was really the first step, if you will, and um, because it, ta it can take up to 10 weeks for um, a, a body to es essentially respond to a pathogen that has, this particular pathogen that has infected them. And so um, even though we are testing initially to see if there is disease there, um, we may not actually know until about 10 weeks later. So they get another test at 10 weeks. We want to minimize, especially for these kids, um, the, the probability that they will develop active disease and severe di disease. And so we put them on something called window prophylaxis. And basically what this means is that they take an antibiotic um, that's very specific for tuberculosis for, um, it depends on when their exposure happened. So it can be several weeks that they would take that window prophylaxis and then they get that retest. This is just kind of breaking that down um, a little bit more in case anyone has any, any uh, more in-depth questions on how this happens. Um, this is, I think, what we gave to, you know, basically what we gave to parents so that they would understand what they were getting, where they were going, um, and things like that. This is just a little bit more on that window prophylaxis treatment. So um, we're offering that to children under four. And this was the reason that children's held the clinic because they were seeing those littles with those more recent exposures. Um, and they had a, a team of, of pediatricians on hand that were able to you know, figure out the dosage and the length of time that the child needed to take the medication and all of that. So um, they're, they are the ones who will be uh, monitoring that. And like I said, it's really just a way to prevent severe disease from, from developing in these kids. This is what our TB pod testing site looks like. So uh, if you go all the way over to the right, you can see where the greeters are. Um, patients come in, they register. Uh, there's a waiting area. We're actually separating them out by age because we know if they're two and under, they're gonna get that PPD. Um, if they're over that age, they're gonna get the blood test. So we have a number of um, stations that are set up for blood test and a couple set up for PPDs. Um, we got phlebotomists uh, and PHL helped us to identify phlebotomists to come in and do that. So drawing blood on kids is not something that uh, just anyone can do well. And so we did ask for some phlebotomists that have pediatric experience. So we're well prepared there. And then we have nurses doing those PPDs at the PPD station. And then when they're finished, we'll have them wait around just a little bit so we can make sure they're doing okay. They get snacks because 
I mean, if you're going to get your blood drawn and you're a little kid, what you need a snack, right? Snacks and stickers is where it's at. Um, we were also able to bring in um, a behavioral health therapy dog to have in the area. So as they come out of getting their blood drawn or getting that PPD, um, we have a small comfort measure for those who might who might uh, benefit from that. And that's it. And then they're out. So it's a pretty organized uh, organized way to do this. This is happening at that YMCA. We figured um, if if parents brought their kids to the YMCA and left their kids at Child Watch, maybe this would be a convenient place to do this. Uh, they have a beautiful gym, so they let us, they're allowing us to use that gym for three days. Um, we're very, very grateful for that, and I think the parents are too because it, it makes things much simpler. So this is just kind of a summary, what we know so far. 270 children were tested at Children's over the weekend. Um, yesterday, I heard that we had uh, at least 150 results back. Our nurse had read, I think, 20 PPDs when I uh, got numbers. So far, all of those were negative. So that is excellent news. Um, however, keep in mind, this is the young cohort that needs, and the, the more recent exposures that are gonna need that second test. So we're very glad that they're negative. We're gonna hope that they stay negative. Um, we are continuing to work with the case to ensure that you know no there is no person left behind in terms of identifying uh, ex any other people who might have been exposed. Um, and if, if we do identify more people, we'll of course offer um, testing and treatment as appropriate. And uh, like I've said, we're doing our, t our testing from nine to three out at the YMCA today, tomorrow, and Friday. All right, any questions about TB response? So just one question, um, you're talking about uh, how TB can be latent mm -hmm. in, the, in the system. When, if you have the latency form, can that eventually turn into active? Yes. Uh, and it can if you've never been treated. So if a person has latent TB, they don't know that they have it. Um, something happens that just kind of knocks their immune system down and allows basically that tuberculosis bacteria to activate and they can then convert to an active disease. Uh, we want to prevent that from happening. So when we identify those latent cases, we put people on a course of medication for several months and that really knocks that risk of converting to active disease down to almost zero. So it's very, very effective. Um, it's probably one of our best control tools that we have for tuberculosis and public health. So yes, the answer is yes, it certainly can and does happen. Um, I, I myself have investigated several cases where that was that's exactly what happened is they just didn't know that they had a latent infection. You know, their exposure was maybe 10, 20 years prior. And then they something happened uh, that their immune system just didn't keep it suppressed and they converted to an active disease. Maybe just one similar follow-up question to the, the previous topic about the, the rabies. Is there a point, you're just starting testing now and you've contained the population that we think has been exposed. Is there a point in time where you'll be able to anticipate declaring um, you know, uh, the next comment on the public health emergency? Yes, I think so. So really once we have done the bulk of the, uh, you know, the testing for, you know, the kids or in any other exposures that might come to light, uh, then we, we can feel pretty confident in saying, you know, we did or didn't have any spread that occurred from this. Um, I do wanna put out there that kids are not great spreaders of tuberculosis. It's kind of the opposite of like every other disease. I feel like kids are like, you know, they're, they spread disease very easily sometimes, especially respiratory diseases, just because they're playing together, they're, um, face to face, you know, it, it can be very easy, but tuberculosis really takes ex some prolonged exposure and kiddos for whatever reason just are not as good at spreading it as adults are. Um, so, you know, the hope of course is that even if we did have some kiddos that maybe uh, we identify with latent disease, you know, it's not gonna activate, it's not gonna spread, 
beyond that. So I'm very, I, I feel really good that it's probably not going to result in like an outbreak situation. Um, we certainly may identify some other latent cases, you know, in this cohort. Um, and if we do, again, we'll put those kiddos on medication that will knock their risk of ever being contagious to other people and being sick themselves down to almost zero. But yeah, there will be uh, a point. It'll take a little bit of time, uh, you know, several weeks uh, before I can say with certainty that we're good. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to express gratitude for the re response of the health department. Your staff did an amazing job. Um, appreciate the presentation, had a, answered a lot of my questions. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And thank you to uh, Children's for, I, I truly cannot say enough about how grateful we are uh, for their effort because pulling this off in the health department alone would have been just an incredibly hard lift. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Um, We'll go on to item B, which is the uh, next uh, report for community benefit. And we have with us Methodist Hospital today. I'll make sure your presentation's up. Where is it? Oh, got it. Silly me. I was looking for the PowerPoint. <clears throat> there you go, Jeff. Hey, you guys have page down on the keyboard where that works. I see. I'm gonna test something here real quick. Okay. Or not. Let me try this. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jeff Prohaska. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Methodist Health System. I'd like to thank the board again for having me to come share and mostly an update on, on Methodist Health System's commitment to the community. Uh, before I start, I did want to make an introduction. I, I have with me Steve Jackson, probably a familiar face to many of you. Steve's a new member to the Methodist team. Uh, very happy to have him and, and his decades of experience and his commitment to the community, which aligns very nicely uh, with our mission and, and with our efforts to, to really be committed to our community. So I wanted to start with that mission. Um, it, it's a consistent message that Methodist has had and, and what we have used as our reason for existence, and, and that is improving the health of our communities by the way we care, educate, and innovate. And like most mission statements, it, it's very carefully crafted. Uh, it, it says a lot about us and, and our purpose. Um, number one, focusing on the health of our communities, um, not just being a hospital in the business of taking care of sick people, really being committed to improving health. Uh, communities is plural. Uh, we are a regional health system. Uh, we are largely focused. The majority of our footprint is here in Douglas County, but we exist in, in Council Bluffs, so Pottawatomie County. We're in Mills County in, in Iowa. We're, we're also in Dodge County in Nebraska and Sarpy County in Nebraska. And each one of those brings a local commitment. And, and we strive to be that committed partner. And I'm gonna use that term a lot of times in this presentation, partner within each of those individual, individual communities. And the terms care, educate and innovate are what we aspire to be. Um, we, we think that care embodies the, the culture uh, of Methodist, our, our people. We educate, we have a couple different responsibilities there. One is to be health educators in the community, to make people more literate with their health responsibilities, to, to understand how to improve their own health. But also, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, the great challenge in terms of healthcare workforce in our community. Uh, we have to be committed to building the future of healthcare and providers of healthcare in, in our area. And, and we, we take a very firm stance on our role to educate those folks. And last, innovation. Uh, times have been very challenging for health systems around the region. Uh, we, we feel that a strong emphasis on innovation will, will allow us to come up with new and creative ideas on how to solve those challenges. We're very proud of our mission statement. We, we try and live that every day. So I'm going to begin with a, a format, if you will, on how we're going to go through the presentation. We're going to 
take a little bit of data from the community health needs assessment. This guides us. It, this, this allows us to focus on the real needs of the community. We do this every three years, uh, and we do this in partnership with the other health systems in town. A very important effort to understand what the needs are so that we're focused on those needs. And the first one, and, and the primary one, and really the one that leads all of us, is access to health care. I, I pulled this particular piece of data because it's our duty, it's our responsibility as a health care provider in the community to make sure that there aren't difficulties in accessing care. And obviously in Douglas County, as we compare that to the Metro and to the US and also the trend of data, we do have some challenges. It's affordability, it's transportation, it's convenience, it's location. You know, all these things stand in the way of, of the folks getting the care and the access to the care that they need. And it's our role to eliminate those, those uh, access challenges. So I wanna first put out our footprint and you'll see it's heavily weighted in Douglas County. And this is just to say that we are present. You know, these are bricks and mortar locations that Methodist Health System has, has put in place to take down those barriers to access. Uh, we have a, a scheduling process where, yes, you can call and book an appointment, but you know, when I talked about those challenges, I referenced convenience. You know, when, when people are sick and they need to come see their provider, they want it to happen now. Uh, and, and I think one of our biggest pieces to, to be committed to the community is to be accessible and we're changing our processes to allow for urgent cares, immediate cares. So urgent care would be you just uh, walk up to a standalone site, which acts as uh, an access point. We have several uh, locations where we have a standalone urgent care, one's coming downtown here opus, opening in December. Um, <clears throat> but the immediate care is any one of these clinics. Uh, we have set up processes where we don't have to require a scheduled appointment to come in and see us. Um, to be available to the community so that they can have an access point convenient and, and, and proximate to them. Also, it's a difficult navi uh, navigation uh, process to, to access your physician oftentimes. Uh, we tried to make that more convenient for the community and, and give them a single number to call. I don't know where to go. Who do I call? 354 CARE. You're speaking to someone has access to schedules from the entire region and, and can find an access point for you uh, to access the care that you need. Every one of these locations, uh, as part of being a tax exempt organization, does have a financial assistance policy. I mentioned one of the barriers to access was affordability. We need to take down that barrier and we do. We, we, uh, we deploy these financial assistance policies at any point of care and, and we'll continue to do so. Now is where I, I point to some of our innovation. Now, that was pretty standard operating procedure for a health system to put clinics in, into the community. Where we wanted to, to be innovative was take care to the people, not by necessarily bricks and mortar in all instances, but to be creative. The first one I wanted to highlight is a new initiative that we are partnering with an organization of volunteer providers here in the community called Heal Omaha. Heal Omaha uh, is, a, is a team of street medicine providers with their backpacks and, and uh, care devices inside those backpacks, they are in place to engage patients that are homeless, that have come through our emergency room. And it's an intimidating environment, and a lot of times those conversations within the emergency room don't always go as, as a, a trusted advisor. We wanted to break down those barriers of communication and put together a team that can go out into the community into the places where these people, uh, where they are living. It might be under a bridge, it might be behind a retail center, but we're finding them and we're engaging them in their environment to have some real healthcare conversations, all with the intention, again, back to our mission of improving health. The next one is our mobile diabetes center. It, it is a coach, it is, a, it is an RV, and it is to take care out into the community. We've, we partnered with Douglas County Health Department with, with this initiative a number of times. Uh, primarily through lead screenings, but through the time of the pandemic, we also use this, this vehicle to deploy care into the community. <clears throat> it, it, it's in place for screening, it's in place for education and delivery of care. Um, also want to announce that this year, most recently, we have added a new coach. So we have two mobile diabetes units. Uh, the second coach is a little bit more nimble. It's a sprinter van. Uh, it doesn't require a driver with a CDL to operate. Um, so we can get into a lot more places and it's a bit more convenient to deploy at a moment's notice. We're really proud of our Methodist Community Health Clinic uh, in partnership with Coos Memorial Lutheran Church. 
And we have uh, an actual free and reduced fee clinic located at a site of need and is adjacent to the Coons Food Pantry and also the Healing Gift Free Clinic. So we have a very high traffic area of people of need. It's in a location that they're very familiar with and, they're, and it's convenient for them and they're accustomed to going through this location. We're using this really in what we call as a hub for collaboration. You know, this is a place where we can go and we can partner with providers and other social organizations in the community to offer screenings and education in a place that people are accustomed to going to. I think I might reported last time when I uh, came to the group that we were piloting a, a screening for social determinants of health at this location. That was our pilot. We have now moved into deployment. Uh, we were very successful at the Methodist Community Health Clinic in learning a lot about screening for social determinants of health. Uh, so much that we are now deploying that across the system to all of our points of care, whether that's in the hospital or amb ambulatory sites. And <clears throat> what we learned at the Methodist Community Health Clinic was, was a couple things. One, screening for it is not always the most difficult thing. Asking a question is really that all, all that pertains to. What's difficult is what do you do when they say yes? I experienced that challenge. That is a barrier for me. Now, it's our responsibility to eliminate or reduce those barriers. <clears throat> our process for creating referrals to resources and developing partnerships with resources in the community so that these patients can seek and access the, the benefits that come along with the resources in the community, that's the challenging part. Uh, a lot of communication has to occur. A lot of data sharing between our EMR and, and their systems has to occur. There's some wonderful partners in the community that are standing up solutions for that and, and we're working with them uh, in order to exchange health information in a, in a safe and private and confidential manner. Um, all with the purpose of, of really helping these people out reduce the barriers that they're experiencing and then trying to reduce the barriers. Using that data of what we're accessing and what referrals we're making and, and what successes are accomplished, we can use that data to then put in policies, procedures, and processes, more relationships in the community in place to manage the health of the population. So it, it's a big, big process. And we know there's a lot of emphasis on so, social determinants of health. Health systems, I think, are trying to, they're, they're finally getting their stride on their role uh, of where we belong and what we, can, what we can fix in terms of these solutions. So a lot of work happening in social determinants of health. More specific, some disease states. Also identified in the community health needs assessment was, was cancer. It, it floated towards the top in terms of mortality. Where we struggle, uh, specifically in our county, is our comparative data between age-adjusted mortality at the local level to the national. And, and we do have a higher mortality rate. And our role as a healthcare provider is, is to help that, is to reduce the overall mortality of cancer. And, and we do that in three different ways. Um, one is early identification, it's screenings. If you can catch cancer early in the process, you've heard stage zero, stage one. If you can catch it early, uh, oftentimes your, your, mortality, your survivability, let's we'll flip, flip the wording there from mortality to survivability, is much greater. And these screenings are very, very important. And we know that not everybody screens exactly as they should. So we have a couple different roles. One is to make screenings very, very easy for people to access. And we've been innovative and we've been very partner driven on finding those places where we can offer those types of screenings. And we've also been very targeted. Uh, our role, we feel, in terms of um, excelling in cancer care is gonna be in your solid tumor cancers. Uh, it's essentially a surgical process. If, if we can excise or cut out surgically uh, the cancer, that, that's our forte. The bloodborne cancers, we know there's foremost experts in the community on that. Um, we, we feel that it's appropriate to be very good uh, stewards, if you will, of, of the process so that we know what we're best at. And, and that's what our screenings are gonna focus on and that's how we're gonna be great at, at identifying these cancers early for folks around the community. We also know that there's some behaviors that can cause cancer and it's our role, it's our duty to go out and promote and to educate and to let people know the correlation bet between certain behaviors, uh, tobacco use, HPV, you know, the, the correlation between those and many different solid tumor cancers is, is absolutely direct. And, and if, we can, if we can modify some of those behaviors, then, then we can reduce the prevalence of cancer and thus reducing the mortality from cancer.
The last one, we also know that there's a direct correlation between hereditary risk and, and cancer and, and thus mortality from cancer. Uh, so putting in place uh, genetic testing and, and hereditary risk programs and helping people understand somewhat confusing results, it, it's very data-driven, very um, intricate, so we have counselors to help them understand results of that and, and then also recommend therapy and, and make referrals for treatment. Innovation, again, taking services to people where they are. Uh, we recognized a low breast screening rate for our communities. Uh, as indicated, women should have a breast screening at, at certain times in their lives. And in our community, they weren't, uh, generally speaking. Uh, the data would suggest that we had to improve our breast screening rates. So one of the innovations we came up with was making it very, very convenient for them. Um, we created a coach uh, based really off of our experiences with that mobile di diabetes unit that if, if we come to you, you're more likely to take advantage of our services, that you're more willing to participate. Uh, so we kind of bifurcated this process. One, we have many great community partnerships where we offer uh, the pink coach, if you will, our, our uh, 3D mobile mammography unit to come and, and locate itself at One World, at Charles Drew at Completely Kids Latino Center, All Care and Council Bluffs, uh, NOAA, North Omaha Area Health, and the Inter Intercultural Senior Center, and park that bus there and see people for screenings. The thing we're finding is, is that particular population within those partner groups has a very low uh, adherence rate uh, to getting the breast screenings when they are indicated. In fact, we, we measure when's your first time you've received a 3D mobile mammography, and we ask, is this your first? 32% of the people that came through this device in those community locations said that this is the first time I've had one. So it, it's making an impact. It's getting people in when they probably otherwise wouldn't. Uh, on a more wider spread note, we have a number of partnerships with, with locations around the community in terms of large employers, small employers, where we have people, uh, HR departments, that are very interested in their employees' health and they want to increase the, the screening rates for their employees. So we're partnering with employers around the community and, and essentially going and parking in their parking lot and, and taking scheduled visits for their people to come down and get mammographies. Shifting gears to heart disease and stroke, uh, we have a prevalence issue uh, with heart disease in our community. Rates are higher than the U.S. and, and trending in the wrong direction for the metro. Um, so we, we want to focus on the care that they receive. And a lot of that has to do in terms of heart disease uh, in the event of a heart attack is how quickly we respond and how accurately we respond. Working with partners like Mission Lifeline, uh, we lead in this space to, to make change. Uh, we want to make sure that people, uh, upon event, upon a heart attack, are taken care of in the most appropriate manner and that they receive the care that they need as quickly and as accurately as possible. This is, this is standard protocol. Um, they are developing, our physicians and our providers are helping develop these protocols to ensure that the, the EMT squads and the hospitals, the emergency rooms, uh, are, are well equipped and knowledgeable of the processes that are most likely to help these patients that need that care. Screenings are important, hypertension, blood pressure, uh, we're in the community doing those types of screenings. And, and then unique to, to us, I think, with our role in women's health with a specialty hospital focused on, on women, Methodist Women's Hospital, we, we found it a, a nice dovetail, if you will. A lot of synergies exist between Go Red for Women with the American Heart Association to, to spread awareness and, and education and knowledge uh, about heart disease for women. Also parlaying our, our role as a, a, a especially women's hospital with a, with a very large uh, birthing population, uh, we have a role, if you will, in infant mortality, which is something within Douglas County and the metro area where, where there was identified need. Uh, that need was, as, as the data suggests, that our infant mortality was trending in a direction opposite of the U.S., uh, almost polar opposite when, it, when you look at the graphs. It looks like we've improved over the last several measurement periods, which is great to see, but uh, obviously there, there's some factors at play there, and, and we feel it's important that we emphasize that, that we focus on that improvement. <clears throat> so within infant health, I want to first start off with a little bit more of a regional approach. 
Uh, birthing deserts is, is a challenge uh, being in the Midwest uh, with a very disparate population. Uh, the population rural versus urban. It's driven purely by population, but just the number of deliveries that exist in a rural setting are a lot smaller than they are in an urban setting. It, it, I guess it ma the math makes sense on that, that you would expect it. But with that comes the competencies and, and uh, skill sets necessary to remain competent. If you're not doing a whole lot of deliveries, you're not going to be as competent. And, and hospitals across our region are recognizing this, that it's becoming unsafe for some hospitals to maintain their delivery programs. Oftentimes, the obstetricians who are specialists in, in childbirth are not locating in rural areas, they're moving to more urban populations, leaving family practice physicians with not a lot of experience or even emphasis on childbirth. So when that occurs, you have a dearth, and, and childbirth, when, when, when a woman goes into labor, proximity is key. You, you need access close. Um, and what we're seeing in these rural populations is a lot of that dwindling. Um, so our maternal fetal medicine group, which is actually the largest in the region, has, has a real charged approach to affecting birthing deserts, uh, to supporting rural hospitals to either one, move that care to the, the hubs, which are slightly more populated but still rural, or, or boosting programs out there through education and, and knowledge sharing in terms of uh, OBs, uh, obstetrics and deliveries. Community education is a big piece uh, as, as it pertains to infants and, and their health. Uh, pregnancy and childbirth classes being offered in the community is something a Methodist, Methodist does. Parenting and, and taking care of infant, infant classes and education is go gonna be a, a big piece. Uh, a leadership role in terms of promoting breastfeeding and the, and the impact that that has on the health of infants. Uh, consults and support groups is one thing to be able to bring people together and learn about the benefits of breastfeeding, but actually facilitating it for those that can't breastfeed. Uh, we do serve as a, a depot, uh, gathering milk from mothers, donating that milk, and then sharing that with those that can't produce. So uh, really facilitating a process that's necessary. And then again, um, arcing back to uh, our involvement in, in genetic testing, uh, I believe you're probably through the course of, of these presentations, the next decade, you're going to hear a lot more uh, about genome, about genetics uh, and its impact on health. So uh, here specifically in terms of pregnancy and, and uh, newborns, uh, genetic testing for, for health there. Sexual health. Um, we've been seeing this on the community health needs assessment as, as long as I've been involved, which is in the early 2000s. So we know that there's something in our community that, that needs to uh, continue to improve, and, and we need leaders in this space. Uh, again, parlaying our position uh, with our specialty women's hospital, we've, we've leveraged that to, to build out some, some access and, and some uh, uh, a good information and education for people in the community as it pertains to sexually transmitted infections. Um, we've been partnering a long time with the Douglas County Health Department on this. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. We've actually stood up some bricks and mortar programs uh, in the sexual health space. One of them is, is a clinic uh, where we do offer assessment, diagnostics, and, and we offer treatments uh, in, the, in the space of sexual health and promoting healthy sexual behaviors. Um, <clears throat> we partner uh, for some free testing, confidential testing for sexually transmitted uh, infections. That's located at the women's hospital. Um, so it, it is something in the community partnered with get access granted uh, to, to make it easy for people to test so that we can stop spreading. Uh, one of the, the pieces of uh, our line of business is we, we see things and, and we experience things, one of which is difficult. It's, it's, sexu it's sexually transmitted diseases that come by the way of sexual assault. Our Sane Start program, which is located in every one of our emergency rooms, is a specialty program for helping the survivors of sexual assault. Unfortunately, some of those cases do involve sexually transmitted infections, and, and we treat those, we, we manage those cases for, for those survivors. Mental health. Um, another issue on the community health needs assessment, a, a definite need in our community. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of our efforts uh, on how we're going to be and have been addressing uh, our, our mental health challenges in our community. Number one is, is what we call swimming upstream, not, not a novel concept, but it's the idea that if, if we can tackle some of these challenges when our community is young, um, that downstream effects can, can be mitigated and that we can really help people out and we can improve the entire community by doing it early. 
With that, we have the community counseling program. The Methodist Community Counseling Program is located in every one of the OPS high schools and every one of the OPS middle schools and every one of the OPS alternative programs. We have a new location we're helping out at Metro Community College and we're also in some neighborhood churches. These are licensed mental health practitioners focused on the behavioral health needs of our youth. Last year we served a thousand, over a thousand people and also last year I was asked Commissioner Rogers that uh, what were they presenting, the top three reasons that they were presenting with, and did some research and for you I found that it was depression, anxiety and behavior problems. Again, in the concept or the idea, the, the theory that if we take care of two people, um, that it will be more accessible and more appropriate, it'll, that it will be more successful. Um, our no-show rate amongst this population is 10%. Double that for most behavioral health counselors. We make it real easy. We, t we put it in the schools. They are uh, a hallway away. Um, when a teacher has a problem, uh, when they recognize a kid might be struggling with those types of issues, when a school counselor who's not necessarily focused on the mental health, but maybe the health of the overall child, notice that there's a specialist right down the hall that can help these kids out. So um, becoming very comfortable in the school environment has been, I think, one of the biggest wins of this program. They're working with so social workers within OPS, um, a lot of partnerships across the community. Uh, we know that there's a lot of effort in, in Douglas County focused on this particular need, so we need to be at the table and we need to be partnering with them. Uh, one, I guess, logistic thing with this program is it's based in the schools, so what do we do in the summer? Um, we recognize that the, the needs don't stop in the summer. Uh, those behavioral health needs still exist, so we decided to, to form some partnerships and some access points within the Boys and Girls Club and Completely Kids. One of our newest announcements is, is another bricks and mortar initiative. This is a new behavioral health hospital, the Methodist Health System will be building in partnership with Acadia. Uh, it'll be located in Council Bluffs, but it is meant to serve the region. So absolutely meant to serve Douglas County and, and surrounding. Uh, we do have behavioral health beds in Council Bluffs, 24 of them. Uh, we have a commitment to that community. Um, as you saw in our mission statement, that community was plural. Um, so having those existing beds over there um, would not be the right thing by any means to do is to pull out. Uh, we needed to stay committed to that community, but we wanted to expand. We wanted to increase access for the region. Um, so um, going from 24 beds to 96 beds is gonna be a big jump. In terms of the programming within the hospital, I wanted to share with you a couple of the things that uh, we plan on, um, it'll be serving general mood disorders, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorders, thought disorders. Uh, we'll have a specialty geriatric unit, a specialty child and adolescent behavioral health unit, and, and we'll also serve dual diagnosis, which includes your substance abuse. Uh, being ingrained in the community is important for this to be a successful endeavor. Uh, it will be a hospital, but it will also offer outpatient services and intensive outpatient services, partial hospitalization. Uh, we want to connect. Uh, we already have some of the doors open in terms of school programming. We want to do more outreach, um, specific suicide prevention training. Um, that's a, a region-wide initiative, but uh, Council Bluffs and Pottawamie County has a big challenge in, in their CHNA, um, so we're going to connect on that space. Uh, counselor training, especially programs for veterans and military outreach, and then we also want to partner definitely. We know the impact that this has on law enforcement, so we're going to be connecting with law enforcement. I don't know if this is a community effort or, or a healthcare in total effort, but I wanted to share with the board, um, just, just so you know some of the major challenges that the health systems are having. Um, when we're in the middle of a strategic planning process right now, uh, we do it every three years, and, and I always lead the process and begin by talking to our leaders and, and to our providers, our physicians, about their major challenges. You know, what are the things that they face uh, on the day-to-day -day and, and the year-to-year that make it difficult for them to live the mission. And at this point in time, the number one issue is resources in terms of people. Um, staffing, hiring, retaining, engaging, developing is a major, major issue and we have a workforce problem and, and we need to be a part of the solution. That, that is, you know, our lifeblood is our people. We, we have a lot of big bricks and, mil bricks and mortar buildings, but the, the things that create experiences, the things that create care and, and, and therapies, it, it's the people. 
and, and we need to get that right. So we set some pretty aggressive goals. Part of it's being innovative. You saw that in our mission statement is that we need to be innovative. Um, we created a problem, and I, the reason I put this slide in here was I was doing the behavioral health section. I said, yeah, you know, our people struggle with behavioral health too. One of the major challenges that we have is, is maintaining a resilient workforce. If they burn out and they turn, we have to replace them. And, and we're a growing organization. We oftentimes have to replace with more. So that's a challenge. So keeping people and, and reducing turnover and, and making sure people are resilient uh, is an effort. It doesn't just happen. So one of the programs we stood up does have to do with behavioral health. And, and it's a point of care type peer-to-peer -peer program. It's called RISE. Uh, it, and it, it's originated out of John Hopkins, but it, it's essentially peer nurses that are skilled. They're trained in identifying someone who might be struggling with a behavioral health issue. And it might be the response of an event that they just witnessed, or it might just be a product of being tired or, or the job experience. And, and these peers are skilled in identifying and, and then very skillfully working with these people. Uh, it doesn't take a licensed care professional. It doesn't take a counselor. It doesn't take a psychiatrist. It takes a peer. But the, we're, we're working to get people in every care setting trained so that they can identify and assist. Some of the innovative things we're doing for, I guess, staffing and recruitment and trying to fill needs is, is we're working with Immigrant Legal Center and the Refugee Empowerment Center to find new and, and innov innovative ways to find people, to find talent. And, and we've been really successful. We're super happy with the results. These are two of the cohorts that we have, and, and every one of these is either a refugee or an immigrant uh, working through their legal center and the empowerment center. We, we're, we're, uh, we're doing it the right way, and we, and we really are encouraged by this program. Um, starting early, again, with that swimming upstream concept, uh, working with local high schools. Uh, we have an upward, upward bound program at Benson and also at Burke to develop future healthcare employees. Um, these are these are high potential, low opportunity kids that uh, we we want them involved in healthcare. So we're showing them the way by letting them behind the veil, if you will, um, shadowing our resources, shadowing our physicians, shadowing our nurses, even our administrators, showing what healthcare really is, and trying to drum up some interest so that they might seek that as a career later. This is my repeat slide from last time. Com Commissioner Rogers, you, you uh, often ask about our, our stance in, in our position on Medicaid expansion. So I'm gonna continue to repeat the message and give you an update. Um, so before Medicaid expansion, uh, there was a, a large uninsured population. Those came to us and, and received care through our financial assistance policies that I referenced earlier. And, and for the most part, that is, that's essentially commonly known as a write-off uh, in, in terms of the, the reimbursement or, or payment to the hospital. That's, that's the write-off piece. Now that Medicaid expansion is occurring and has occurred, uh, we have a much larger population that has insurance. They have Medicaid, and, and that's a good thing. They have coverage, they have access to better health care. Um, the reality is, is that in terms of a government payer, the reimbursement covers about 80 to 85% of the costs of the provider. So with that, we're shifting, and this is just in how we measure it, measure it. There's a shift from what was previously written off to something that counts as community benefit, which is that loss that we take on, on the reimbursement. So 20 to 15%, okay? That means that that 80 to 85% is new money. And, and you ask what's being done with it. And the, what's being done with it is investment or reinvestment in that community health improvement. Uh, it's the best way we can illustrate on, on how we're able to do early identification, how we're, how we're focusing on health equity, and, and through this presentation, which it's all been about social determinants of health, um, that's where that pro programming can be reinvested in. And I've, I've used the term partner uh, a ton of times through, through this presentation. I think it's, it's ultimately because we want to be the best partner uh, for the residents of Douglas County. It, it's a team effort. It, it's, we can't do it ourselves, and, and we do need assistance and, and partnership and teamwork. So I'm going to end with a slide that lists our partners. And I have Steve's name up at the top. When, when I hired Steve, I said, you have two objectives. It is to maximize our community benefit, which was that pie chart and it is to make a bunch of partners. We're up to 225 in the community. So this list, the font's gonna keep getting smaller and smaller so we can fit it all on one slide, and that's very intentional to look this way so you can see how many of them there are. Be very happy to answer any questions for you.
Um, hopefully this was informational and, and you, you get again the updates on the Methodist story. Thanks, Jeff, for that uh, overview. I appreciated uh, mm -hmm. all that information. Uh, one area I was going to just have to expand upon a little bit was um, appreciating your mobile strategies and reach reach out to populations that have a difficult time with access, mm -hmm. and in particular, uh, the street medicine mm -hmm. uh, program. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of is that a, you know are they on the street weekly? Are they coordinating with the mayor's homeless? coordinator and shelters and how is that working right R relatively new initiative um, and, and great idea to connect um, it is a partnership model with some of the Methodist providers um, now has started heal Omaha and we directly refer to them so in, in terms of their connection and frequency it, it's as they are referred uh, the pace at which that occurs depends on the pace at which that population comes into our emergency room uh, in terms of their partnership in the community, uh, I know that there's um, a lot of connection that they're making just simply because it's such an innovative program. There's a lot of interest. Mayor's office is a great idea. Good. Yeah, and now um, we're working on that actively right now with yeah. our homeless situation and um, what seems to be an increasing population in need of these services. Point of contact. So that'd be great. Okay. Tamara Dwyer. Thank you. Yeah. Steve. Okay. Thanks. Oh, I... Hear me? Yeah. Now it's on. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Regarding the Heal Omaha um, program, if an individual who is homeless comes to one of your emergency care departments, mm -hmm. logistically, I'm curious, what do they give as their address, and how do you then follow up to find them yep. for the continuity of care. That's exactly it. It's, it's the patients without an address. A and what they're finding is, is that there are common lo locations where they stay and it's not an address. It, it's a conversation. It's a, where have you been staying the last week? Where have you been? And they find out those locations. Yeah, it, it is a challenge. It's not 100%. You know, the, there are some that disappear. Um, but the effort to be able to uh, connect with them, and that's the concept of street medicine. You're probably familiar with that. Um, it is exactly that, to get them in their environment so that that real conversation can be had and real change can be made. So w would a question by the health care provider be, um, I, I would really like to see you next week. Where would be the best place that I might mm -hmm. find you during mm -hmm. the daytime? Yep. And yep. They, they might respond under the bridge yep. down It's part of our social determinants of health screening process. Okay. That, that is a big piece of it is identifying homelessness. There we go. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm interested to hear like, if you have any initial results or data from your social determinants of health screening and like, what were the top three needs and um, were there particular partners you looked at for those needs? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so homelessness and education were the top two and, and poverty was dovetailed with education. And those were all just the results of the location at Methodist Community Health Clinic um, that's getting rolled out, and that's the data that, you know, as we get system-wide, we'll be able to really evaluate. Um, obviously, the, the homeless shelters are, are big connection points on that, and, and health literacy is another one um, that we're trying to make partnerships in. Um, it, it's something that the pilot proved that we can do the process, uh, that we can, we can identify, and then we can connect, then we can follow up. And that's, it was on a very small scale. Um, we see about 5,000 patients a year at, at that clinic. We see about 700,000 visits a, at our network wide. So to build that to scale, it's going to take a big effort. But you imagine the power of the data that you can get when you scale that from 5,000 to 700,000. And, that, and that's what we're looking forward to. That's, that's population health. It really is. It equates to when we, when we build the whole thing out, it would be about access to 305,000 people across our community. That, that's our patient panel size. If we look at all of our primary care offices, we care for 305,000 people. So that's that's the person to person scale. Jeff, just like, so you said education. When you said education, you said something else. So when you say education, you mean health literacy? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious. Let, well, let me ask you this question first, knock it out the way. There's a question here. Uh, question is, 
um, what, what's Methodist doing with infant health in rural areas? No, wait, wait a minute, no, that's mm -hmm. a question. Mm -hmm. What activities is Methodist doing to address black infant mortality or in the urban areas? And then the second piece is, could you talk a little more about your close partnership with law enforcement? Uh, what will you be doing with them? Okay. Uh, on the first one is, one, we have access with Commissioner Boyle, I, I think has pointed us in the right direction in our connection with IB Black Girl. And <clears throat> we want to definitely be active in that space, and, and that's prim our primary vehicle for that. Um, second question was connection to law enforcement. Um, has been relatively narrow but highly impactful. Um, mm -hmm. Again, our space uh, in, in Sane Start Sexual Assault um, that's been kind of our leadership role uh, in, in terms of uh, partnership with OPD. Uh, we do have that in every one of our emergency rooms, and that is in partnership. And, and how it dovetails primarily is those are specialty care providers, um, not only uh, the special needs of those survivors, uh, but also in, in terms of prosecution. Uh, there's certain uh, specimen collection that can occur, and, and these, these care professionals are specialized in sexual assault and how to perform that so we can improve the uh, the rates of, of uh, prosecution. Your community connections piece that has some play with the schools. You all still doing that piece when you uh, were community years? counseling program? Yeah, that, that's in the schools. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. It's largely driven. I, I'd say ninety five percent of of that enterprise is located and and in partnership with the schools. Um, we have a few other locations with Metro Community College and then also in some churches. I'm just curious, you had any, have you all seen any, well, you mentioned the mental health piece and depression, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. school stuff, you seen any COVID related hangover or <clears throat> what you can identify with that? Our numbers came back really strong in terms of people using the program. Um, COVID, again, I come back to innovation. Um, we had to very quickly stand up a, a virtual pro platform in order to do it because mm -hmm. um, the, the problem didn't go away. Uh, it probably com made things more complex and, and care was less accessible. Um, mm -hmm. So we wanted to stand up that virtual program. Uh, it, it worked. We were able to maintain uh, it as a going concern through COVID. Um, but once we got back into schools, once kid, kids got back in schools, yeah, absolutely rebounded and, and then some. Well, I, I guess I'm and to make it clear, I'm just curious. You know, you hear about the fact that they say there, there may be some depression and mm. other stuff that, that has affected yeah. COVID. So I'm just wondering. We haven't stratified the depression data. At least okay. I haven't seen it. But yeah, that's a good question. And, and you know, I was listening to your questions. I'll, I'll bring that back. Okay. No, I appreciate it. You, you, you have knocked out a couple of things. So that, that's, I'd have to say so far from who we've heard about. I mean, everybody has uh, answered questions from the past and been there. So that, that's, good. that's been great. That's what we're here for. Um, anything else? Say nothing. Appreciate it. All Thank right. You. Thanks so much. Thank you for the report. All righty. With that said, uh, item five, any questions based on the reports that you all received this month? Okay, seeing none. Are there any, uh, is there any requests for anybody to dig into anything deeper uh, on the scheduled December administrative meeting, and if not, we'll make plans to cancel that. So if it is, I would say if somebody's got something, please, in a week. If I don't hear from you in a week, then we'll just uh, not have that meeting in December. Um, with that, there is nothing else. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Motion by Weiss. Is there a second? Second. Second, Festerson. Roll call. Mr. Hayes? Yes. 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 See you all in December. Thank you.